I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have all our uh, council members in attendance this evening, and um, we have a motion to approve the agenda as submitted or amended. A motion. Move to approve as submitted. Second. Road second to Har. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I am going to, um, we have a few twirlettes in the room in case some people haven't noticed. <laughs> because on our consent agenda, we have a proclamation. Um, to, uh, to uh, recognize them for winning the Junior uh, Grand National Championship. So I'd like to ask them, the twirlettes, to come up along with Susan Usher and I'll read this to you. <coughs> I understand that this is the second Grand National Championship time that you guys have won and You've also won 13 times the division championship, and I also would, um, I think we all should recognize, I know you all did uh, a fantastic job representing our community and worked hard to get here, but I also wanted to recognize Susan Usher for her 17 years, she said, of work to get to this place with this uh, group. So let's give them a round of applause. You guys need to be in front. So let's get you guys up front so people can see. Okay, can we see everybody now? So I'm going to read the proclamation while everybody's taking pictures. Whereas the Celine Twirlettes have been a long standing group of youth in Celine, which has grown over the past 43 years bringing together youth from Milan, Tecumseh, Monroe, Ann Arbor, Dexter, Grass Lake, Brooklyn, and Ypsilanti. And where is the Celine Twirlettes national team, a group of 23 twirlers aged 9 to 22, competed this past summer at the national championships against 25 of the best teams across the country. And where is the Celine Twirlettes national team presented their version of Revenge of the Nerds as their routine for the national championship competition, which included the twirlers dressing as nerds, schoolgirls, and bad girls, as well as using many props, interpretive twirling skills, and costume changes. And whereas the Celine Twirlettes national team was announced as the junior grand national champions for their outstanding performance and were awarded the six foot, right here, uh, 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 excuse me, six foot Hutchinson Dynasty traveling trophy, a traveling trophy that they will be proud owners of for one year. And whereas the Celine Twirlettes, under the leadership and guidance of director Susan Usher, assistant coach Amy Branch, choreographer Missy Townsend, and show designer Cliff Gray, excelled in this competition, bringing re recognition to themselves and the Celine community. Now, therefore, I, Gretchen Driscoll, mayor of the city of Celine, on behalf of the Celine City Council and the citizens of Celine, do hereby congratulate the Celine Twirlettes national team for the success they've achieved as individuals and as a team in winning the Junior Grand National Championship title with sincere best wishes for continued success in the future. And also hereby thank Susan Usher, Amy Branch, Missy Townsend, and Cliff Gray for their dedication, enthusiasm, and guidance given this Celine Twirlettes in their quest for achieving this highest honor. Congratulations. Virginia to New York and all over Michigan. 
obviously they can't be here, but they're part of our uh, sick stuff, and uh, people come to Sling uh, because they know our team and that we have a good good success story and we have a good work ethic. And a lot of that is due to the support we get in the community. Although a small community, um, we are very proud. Uh, we always go by our Sling for the name when we compete. And when we twirl different places across the state or at colleges, the University of Michigan, and Eastern, even here at uh, Sling High School, we're always very proud to represent the Sling Twirlettes. And the girls know, and our gentlemen know that, um, you know, we always talk about how we represent ourselves and that people notice us. And even though we don't know you, that they, you may see them or see their blue coat and know that they're Twirlettes. Or, or we make that a very important thing on our team to uh, represent very well. And uh, these young ladies do in the gym work very hard. Uh, you know, when they get out of school, they pretty much train all day long, every day in the summer, until we go to nationals, and we kind of set a goal and commitment. And this year, um, we entered into this division never, you know, we never quite know how hard it's going to be. Um, but when we got there, we knew how hard it was going to be. And we see the other teams from Nebraska to Wisconsin to Florida. So the caliber of throwing is very high. People are doing exactly what we're doing and training even more. And so we knew it was going to be tough. And uh, everyone rise up to the challenge. They really enjoy um, our Revenge of the Nerds. And hopefully someday you'll get to see it in town. We're hoping to take the show on the road so that people can see it. Because it is, does have kind of a humorous uh, uh, twist to it. Something that people don't expect. So um, it was very exciting for us because it was kind of uh, unknown. It wasn't something that we thought we could have really accomplished because we were new in this division. But uh, we were all very excited, and we were really excited to get the six foot trophy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as you can see, it kind of just makes a prominent stance of how important it is. And um, our name will be on it. It will say Celine Ross from Celine, Michigan, and that will carry on. And we'll take that back to nationals, and maybe we'll be back to the I think our state representative, Mark Wimetz, in the audience, would you like to come up and speak? I bent the mic the wrong way, so sorry about that. Just pull it back. Now you can figure out how tall I am compared to the <laughs> I feel like I'm robbing a uh, liquor store until the height. Um, that's uh, really a great uh, uh, accomplishment that they all had with that championship. Very impressive. I just wanted to take a few moments and talk about a couple of things just to make you all aware of what uh, is on the fall agenda in Lansing. Uh, some of this is uh, certainly uh, old news, but certainly uh, items that um, you'll be hearing more about as we go through the legislative agenda. First being that um, there will be a school of choice for discussion as to which every school district has an opportunity to look at. Do they want to uh, participate in school of choice? There's going to be some uh, discussion regarding uh, keeping it uh, uh, open for all schools. Uh, I think uh, the vast majority of people are looking at just making sure that the, each individual school district gets to make their own decision as to what they would like to see. Also, uh, looking at uh, 401k, uh, defined contributions to replace uh, the system that we're all in now. 
and uh, that's going to be another subject. And also we're looking at restructuring the court and reforms to um, many of the judge positions to look at and see if there's duplication, and if so, how do we eliminate that? And um, one of the other major things, of course, is uh, medical marijuana. That will be uh, something that's gonna be front and center. I think when the, uh, when it was passed uh, by the voters, I think there was great concern. We didn't really do a good job explaining what and why of it all. And it's been uh, really pushed down to local government like yourselves to try to work through many of the uh, complex issues of it. And the state's gonna be taking that up and having uh, hearings on that as well. And then also, and something that you all have been working on, consolidation of uh, emergency 911 dispatch centers. And there'll be uh, further discussion on that. And uh, that will be something that uh, we're looking to make sure we continue to empower local governments to structure their own systems, but uh, look at hopefully that if the opportunity avails that they can uh, combine services and dispatches. And then of course, uh, personal property tax, that will be something that uh, should be rolled out relatively soon from the governor's office. And uh, there's also been great focus on it already. I spent the um, best part of this morning working with the uh, Michigan Township Association regarding that issue. And uh, that will be, as I say, in the next couple of weeks being rolled out and we'll have a better understanding what the vision is and then what some bills that we can react to. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions if that's okay with you, Mayor. Sure. Yeah. Council, questions? Yes. Right. Representative Womet, um, thank you for being here. Could you talk a little bit about the legislation that you introduced regarding the consolidation and privatization of building engineering departments? Yeah, what that is, is uh, we, we received a lot of input. We put the MML together and Michigan Township Association and others talking about um, the challenges that they're having because of uh, reduction in staffing and being able to service the um, constituent base. And one of the things that we've done is, and we're working on a bill that will be coming forward that will allow um, governmental units to go ahead and start with uh, subcontracting that work out. And one thing that, of course, we're doing that, many jurisdictions are doing that now, but what this gives it is uh, the okay to do it, number one, and number two, to be able to make sure that the overall uh, issue of pricing on that lies with the governmental body. And that was one of the major uh, issues. What, what is the enforcement? and how do you pay for that? And making sure that local government has that authority. Thank you. And is that piece of legislation, Representative, is that in your, the committee that you chair? Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> okay, I don't think so. I know you, we talked about personal property tax yeah. and that you were in favor of... A well, personal property tax, um, one of the things that I think is important and we're getting a lot of feedback on is doing a replacement dollar for dollar uh, phase in program over multiple years or phase out depending on how you look at it. And I think one of the other things that um, and talking actually today with Michigan Township, which I think we're on the right track with is, is there are about 50% of the filings on personal property tax are very low dollar amount and to see what we can do about not having to have those actually filed those kind of tax returns because it's fairly expensive the lower dollar return we looked at some of the townships that were getting a hundred or two hundred dollars a year of revenue off of that and so that's about fifty percent so we're really focusing back on uh, the large dollar amount uh, it looks like utilities may be exempt from that as well so they'll continue to pay personal property tax um, so it, it's, you know, it's a work in process and we're all anxiously awaiting the bill uh, to be uh, dropped. We're also hoping it would be guaranteed. One of the, yeah, one of the other points is, that. yeah, you one of the other points that. is that I, I think with the track record of uh, state government, uh, I personally would like to see that the taxing unit, the local taxing unit is the one who receives 
the tax payment versus having the tax payment go to the state and then the state remit it back to uh, local government. You know, the track record of state government has not been particularly good about making sure you get your dollars back, i.e. what we did with uh, many of the uh, statutory responsibilities that the uh, state did not follow through with in the last several years. Oh, thank you. We appreciate your support. Any, anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have the Green Thumb Awards. I know Angie uh, Van Schoik and Ari Carl, are you going to help too? I'm the photographer. You're the photographer. <laughs> okay. Well, you're a parks, have, our parks chairperson. Yes. So uh, we're glad yes. you could come tonight and have a little extra excitement with a right. trophy. <laughs> Got upstaged a little bit, but that's all right. <laughs> Um, we had four awardees uh, this year out of, uh, we had 49 residential nominations and five commercial. Um, so we had three winners out of the residential nominations and then the one winner from the five commercial. Uh, the first person that we have up here is uh, Marla Limelin. Come up. Uh, we have this great pot for you. Thank you. It's kind of heavy. <laughs> and we also have uh, an award. It just says the 2011 Green Thumb Award presented to Marla Limelin in recognition of maintaining a beautiful garden in the summer of 2011 at 599 Rosemont. Oh, thank you very so, much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next one is for Heidi Graber. And she lives at 416 Berkshire. So each of the certificates stay pretty much the same thing. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Our next residential award goes to Sharon Nabilski. I don't think she was able to come tonight. So the last goes to Annette Helmuth for Back to Basics Montessori. I just want to say on behalf of the city of Saline and I think our citizens, we want to say thank you for keeping our community beautiful and doing going the, above and beyond. So to be winners out of 49 um, nominees is pretty amazing. So thank you so much for beautifying our community. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you <pro> sorry. <laughs> You're probably going to say that, but <laughs> just took the words out of your mouth. But my apologies. Not a problem. So that was. It for the green. Okay, part we have the parks annual report. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next thing is the annual report, uh, which you all should have gotten a copy of. Uh, in the past uh, year, the three areas that we focused on were the Saline Parks brochure, uh, increasing participation in the green film, and also doing community activities in three different parks, um, increasing the number of programs in those parks as well. A further brochure, uh, we collaborated with the 212 Arts Center to create a trifold brochure um, that lists all the different parks, the amenities that are there, um, just basic information. So for people that come to Saline, they can easily see what parks we have and what uh, resources are available at those parks. Uh, for the Green Thumb Award, um, like I said, there were 49 residential and five commercial nominations. Uh, we had a lot more nominations this year than we had in uh, past years. I want to do special thanks to Commissioners Popovitz, Hess, and Johnson for all the work that they did in terms of going out and placing the nomination signs, taking photographs, nominating people that they had, or notifying people that they had been nominated, and just kind of coordinating all of that. 
Um, for the awards, uh, Megan Canahan at 212 Arts Center, uh, we commissioned her again this year to create the pots as the gifts for the uh, people that won. For uh, park promotion, uh, every year we do park cleanup day. Um, we also have movie in the park and rec on the go that we do in collaboration with Parks and Rec. And we also this year did an orientation, uh, orienteering course instruction uh, that we had 10 participants at Curtis Park. Uh, Stephen Amori actually showed us how to use the orienteering course that he had placed in the park and kind of walked everybody through it. You know, so we learned how to use our compasses and how to read those and be able to get to our destinations from each rock that he had placed and learn what kind of saying that he had put up in there. So that was a, a lot of fun. Uh, we also had an owl call, uh, 21 people registered for that and sat and waited in the hopes of having an owl land in their midst. And unfortunately, an owl did not show up, mm -hmm. but um, they learned a lot of different information and we're hoping to do that in subsequent years as well. And we also had a tree climbing clinic where 37 people participated, um, essentially just kind of going up in the trees and being able to see the world from a different view. Uh, for fiscal 2012, the goals that we have are to expand and impro improve the Parks Commission portion of the City of Saline website, um, just kind of getting more information out there. Uh, we also want to have community activities in three different parks. So kind of like what we did with the orienteering course, uh, the owl call program, and the other things that we do along with the Parks and Recreation. Uh, we also like to increase Park Cleanup Day participation. Uh, just getting more volunteers to come and help. Um, in past years, we've had um, Boy Scout, Girl Scout troops come and help us out and just trying to get more of them to you know, be part of our volunteer group. Uh, we're also wanting to look at finding out how to do a program for community wood chips. Um, I know when we have a lot of sling trees that go down and we chop them up, I think in years past they were getting shipped off somewhere and we want to look into a possibility of maybe having something where people can come in and take wood chips away um, if like a parks commissioner was there to kind of keep an eye on things. And another thing that we were wanting to do is to increase the parks commission's presence in social media. So kind of do more Facebook, Twitter, uh, whatever other things are popular to keep us out there and keep our citizens informed about what we're doing. So that's, that's great. Annual report. Any Councilors have questions for Angie? No question, but just to comment, it sounds like the Parks Commission is pretty active in doing things out in the community. That's good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And thanks for all your hard work. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, we have citizen comments on agenda items under the Open Meetings Act. Any citizen may come forward at this time, make comment or question on items that appear on this agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person. And we would like to speak as requested, but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Uh, my name is John Heller, 213 Sheffield. And the first thing I'd like to do, I'd like to have um, the consent agenda item <clears throat> C11161 removed. And since I won't be able to speak to it when it becomes up on the regular agenda, well, I would just like to say that I think it's disgraceful to be, in, even in normal times, to be spending over $1,300 to send the mayor on a political junket to Phoenix for three days. And I think it's awful to be doing it in bad times like these. And I think it's even worse that you're doing it when two months ago you were talking about cutting an essential service of police dispatch and laying some of the lowest paid employees of the city off. I also think that if you want to know why the legislature and the public is thinking that local governments don't need the revenue from personal property taxes, this is the kind of spending that gives them that idea. Um, on another matter, I'd like to object to the last paragraph on the first page of the letter from Plant Moran. Um, to me, I don't think that an accounting firm can classify a report that it submits to a public body as secret and restrict its use. Um, I think that the management of the city is its citizens, and I don't think that they should be prohibited from 
using a document that shows how the finances of the city are being used. Um, and just so everyone knows what that paragraph says, it's actually just a sentence. It says, this report is intended solely for the use of city council and the management of the city of Saline and is not intended to be and should not be used by anyone other than these specified parties. Um, I don't think it's right for an accounting firm to be able to withhold information from the public, the citizens. And if I was on council, I'd refuse to accept this letter with that paragraph in it. I think it's anti-democratic. It borders on being Orwellian. Thank you. Further citizen comments? Okay, uh, consent agenda, uh, the point following consent agenda will normally be adopted without discussion or at the request of any citizen or council member. Any item may be removed from the consent agenda for council discussion. We already had a request for 11-161. That will be moved under new business after 11-166. Do we have any other changes to the consent agenda? If not, do we have a motion to approve and adopt the items on the consent agenda as, submitted, as amended? So moved. Move Gearba. Do we have a second? Second. Get moral. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Under unfinished business, item 1024, this is the audit report for fiscal year ended June 30th, 2011. We will be having a presentation by our auditors, and um, if you're, you could please explain that, why that paragraph's written the way it is, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. And also clarify that these are public documents. Absolutely. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Olenek. I'm the partner uh, from Plant Marin uh, that's involved in the audit for the city. With me is Yusha Davis, uh, who's the manager on the audit, and then also Nick Gurika, who's the in charge. Uh, Nick would be kind of responsible on every day um, of being here, supervising staff, and making sure everything gets done. So, he's basically doing the grunt work, and uh, Alicia and I kind of uh, get to supervise um, on a kind of couple days a week. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, city and uh, its staff, particularly Mickey Joe as well as Lee, for all the hard work they've done. I know it takes a lot of responsibility, a lot of uh, everyday uh, you know, nuisance by the auditors to come out and ask a lot of questions and ask for a lot of records. So we appreciate it. I know it's uh, very tough, especially with all the other challenges and making sure everything else is done and the city is running smoothly. Um, I did want to point out a couple things. So first, I'd like to address the paragraph that is mentioned in the uh, letter. I'm going to cover the letter later on in a little bit more detail, but I did want to mention the uh, paragraph. Uh, the report is intended for the city, uh, for the city council and city um, management. However, it is a public uh, document that is actually available uh, and it's um, uploaded to the state. So the state has the document, so it's not just a document that's held within the city. Um, it is a public document. Um, the report itself, the financial statement, uh, you'll see the thickest document that's uh, actually been distributed earlier, I think uh, last week. Uh, that's the financial statement. Uh, it is your financial statement. Uh, I did want to mention that on page, uh, page one is the opinion letter, and that's basically the letter that Plant Moran issues. Everything else does belong to you. Uh, the opinion letter is a clean opinion. It's called an unqualified, which is the highest level of assurance you can obtain on a set of financial statements and basically says you can rely on the numbers that are in the financial statements for your budgeting, et cetera. Uh, that, you know, everything that was done is in accordance with uh, generally accepted accounting principles. Um, instead of going page by page uh, for the report, Alicia is going to go over the graphs that were passed out today, and it's also available on the screen. And she'll go in details about some of the funds, and like I said, instead of going page by page, she'll also mention a couple things in the report, kind of highlight some differences from last year. So, Alicia, go ahead. Thank you, Martin, and good evening, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and just dive right into it here. Starting with the general fund, um, obviously that's where the primary operations are reflected of the city, so we'll spend a little bit of time focusing on some things going on in the general fund. Um, starting here on this first slide, we're looking at the revenue in the general fund um, based on different revenue sources. So in the light blue there and in the dark blue, those both relate to property tax revenues. Um, one represents, the darker one represents resident residential property taxes, and the lighter one represents non-residential. So collectively, there you're seeing that property tax continues to comprise a majority of the revenue sources in the general fund, um, in aggregate about 71% for the fiscal year ending 2011. 
I did want to mention also that, you know, although that continues to be a huge portion of your general fund revenue, um, it still did come in under where you would have projected it to be in your amended budget by about $550,000 uh, overall. And, and that really was almost directly uh, contributed to property tax revenues, and there was two factors there. One, obviously you've been seeing the declines there in taxable value, and the second item um, relates to accounting rules which say to the extent that you anticipate significant refunds in your property tax revenue, you should reflect those um, reductions in the year in which those taxes were levied for, and so that was done this year, um, causing you uh, collectively to come in under budget there. So still looking at those same sources of revenue in the general fund, but not what we've done is shown you here a five-year trend for comparative purposes of those revenue sources. Um, similar, the results are really similar to when I, when I was saying, you know, if you think about your amended budget to where you were actual, uh, there's a similar trend there with where you were last year in your property tax revenue and this year, and it would be those same two reasons that resulted in that decline there. Uh, relative to your state sources, uh, you have been seeing that decline as well since 2008. And collectively, um, over those past four years, that revenue source has declined by about 15% uh, overall for the city. Other sources, you're also seeing declines there over the past few years. And that's primary, uh, primarily attributable to uh, the significant declines that we've seen in the, um, in the market and your related returns on the investments that you're holding, which have declined substantially. Now I'd like to jump into general fund expenditures. Again, doing the same thing where we're looking at composition by type or department. Um, so the, the biggest piece of general fund expenditures are shown there in the blue, which represent general government expenditures, followed by public safety there in the yellow, um, and then collectively uh, you see the other items there too. But really those, those two make up the primary expenditures of the general fund. Uh, overall, total expenditures in the general fund were about $8.2 million for the year less than budget by about 270,000. So, you know, kind of seeing that your, your revenue was coming in a little under where you projected, you did a good job of kind of reeling in some of those expenditures and also getting those to be less than budget as well. So, um, so good management there. Um, and, and we'll get into this more, but when we're talking about, you know, actual results, general fund revenue came in at 7.5. I just mentioned that total expenditures were about 8.2 million. Um, without transfers, you're seeing a total reduction in your general fund fund balance for the year of around $575,000. If we add in transfers in and out of the funds on a net basis, um, you'll see a total reduction in the general fund revenue for 2011 of about $1.3 million, um, which is really close to what you budgeted. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, kind of how you planned um, for that and, and did accumulate some reserves in order to be able to allow that to happen. Same thing here, um, showing the five-year trend of those same general fund revenue expenditures. Uh, just one thing I wanted to highlight here for clarification, if you look at general government, public safety, again, the two largest components, uh, you do see some of those numbers jump up from uh, 2010 to 2011. That's primarily related to um, the pension and retiree health care funding that you did uh, approve as a council. So now we're looking at the general fund, fund balance um, over an extended period and just looking at the trend there. A um, couple different things represented here. So of the general fund fund balance, uh, the yellow there is representing undesignated portions with the gray representing amounts that have been designated. Um, I've got to point out a, a correction that I don't know what happened here, but in the last slide, the, the one that you have in front of you and also in mind, the 2011 amount should say 24% versus 5%. So I, I apologize um, for the error in, in the projected version, uh, but that really is the, the percent that you should be seeing there. And what those percents are representing are the percent of expenditures for the year, or the percent of fund balance over annual expenditures for that year. Uh, so a couple of thoughts on this one. From 2010 to 2011, you did see a drop there in your general fund balance, as I had uh, mentioned previously. Again, that was budgeted. You did, you know, use some of those fund balance reserves to help balance your budget in 2011. Um, but what you've done here, you know what? I, I don't know what 
can I just have you focus on the, the one in front of you because something's going on weird here with the projected version and those some of those percentages are not accurate. Oh, um, yeah, definitely not right. Accurate. Yeah, <laughs> but but you know all, all the printed versions, including mine, are accurate. So starting in 2004, you're actually seeing the graphs are right. So the trend data is still right if you ignore the percentages. The, the trend is still accurate. So starting in 2004, there you can see you had that lower fund balance level and you know, you had planned well and been very strategic about building those fund balance reserves all the way up through 2009 through 2010, um, even to levels that, you know, we rarely see in most of our communities. Uh, so it, it positioned you very well kind of when you got to this difficult year to be able to use up some of those reserves and still be uh, in good position relative to your fund balance accumulations, which, again, for clarity, is at about 24% in 2011. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is during the current year, the city was required to adopt uh, one of a, the accounting pronouncements, which was relevant for the year, uh, GASB 54. Um, and all that really, the, the primary thing that did for the city is it changed what you call your fund balance. So we used to use these terms designated and undesignated. And actually, those terms have been replaced by five new terms that you'll see if you look in your printed copy of the financial statements. However, for comparative purposes, since we had this long history under the old terms, we did want to still present it, um, you know, to show an apples to apples comparison. But you'll see in your report that those um, classifications have changed. Um, so going away from the general fund now, uh, showing some capital and related expenditures by type um, for the city. So there you can see for 2011 in our furthest right column, uh, there were some expenditures for highway and street construction, um, some additional expenditures for water and sewer improvements and repairs, and then also some um, general fixed asset purchases, which included things like uh, some land improvements and, and vehicle improvements. What this, um, what this presentation does is it actually takes a general fund, combines all your other governmental funds, your debt service funds, your special revenue funds, all governmental funds, puts them together, and then it presents them on a full accrual basis, so a little bit different basis of accounting than what you're used to with your budget, but uh, the presentation would be consistent to what you'd see in like a private sector, even in your enterprise funds. So on this basis of accounting all governmental funds, um, Looking at revenues still, you can see that property taxes continues to comprise a majority of revenue overall. In this instance, it's not as big of a portion. So on this base, it's about 52% combined, followed by in the dark there, the dark blue, um, pardon me, uh, charges for services. And a majority of those charges, charges relate to your recreation center. So program and user fees make up a big portion of that followed by the green bar there, which are capital grants and contributions. And in this particular year, that amount actually does include some donated assets and some donated roads that you received this year. Looking at the same basis of accounting, um, those same funds on the full accrual basis, this time now looking at expenditures in the composition there, um, you can see that general government continues to be still the largest portion of those expenditures, followed by public safety there in the yellow, um, streets and highways uh, right up top there, 20%, and then rec and culture is the fourth largest item. This represents the property tax composition for all um, the mills that are levied to your residents. And really one of the big things that this really demonstrates is, and I think it serves as a good reminder to the taxpayers that although, you know, the city administers and collects and disperses uh, the property taxes, uh, there's only a small portion that's actually retained by the city. Uh, so if you look at, you know, on the principal residence or, you know, the, uh, the homestead there, a little over 44 mills, uh, the non-homestead is a little over 62 mills. But in total, Celine's portion is only 15.53 mills of those overall mills. So just a reminder that a big piece of that revenue, uh, large portions of those revenues that come in actually go out to other taxing authorities and are not retained by the city. And then this here just shows your um, mills levied over an extended period um, here at the city. And you can see there that, you know, you've been able to keep your... Uh, your millage base consistent for the past uh, seven or so years. 
And then looking at the next slide there, it actually shows your millage compared to some of your neighboring communities. Um, you know, it's just an informational demonstration. Uh, as well, we also show there the excess level, levy capacity that you have. So comparing what your authorized mills are to what you actually levy to your residents, um, you can see you've got close to two mills there of excess capacity, um, which is a good place to be in because we're seeing more and more of our communities max that out as they're trying to balance their budget. Um, you know, so with the uncertainty of state should revenues and personal property taxes, um, certainly good to know that you've got some cushion there. Now we're looking at uh, the trend in taxable value for the city for the past five years. Um, and if you look at that total line there, you can see that that has been on a steady decline since 2008, which of course is no surprise to any of us. Um, I did want to clarify that this is presented on a fiscal year ended basis. However, because of the lag between tax year and fiscal year, 2012 there is for the budget year that you're in now, but represents 2011 tax year. Uh, so over that, that period, you're seeing uh, an overall decline in your, your taxable value of about 10% here at the city. Now we get into um, looking at you know, the impact that Proposal A had on the taxable value that you're levying uh, in your community. So kind of going back to 2001 there, you can see the representation where um, there were significant tax revenues that were foregone, given that you were limited to only levy taxes on the taxable value versus SCV, like you used to do before Proposal A um, that was effective in 1994. But with the housing market, it's taking uh, an interesting uh, change there where that gap, which was growing for so many years, I mean, you got to the point 2006, 2007, where it was like a $1.1 million of forgotten revenue for the city. And now that gap has just uh, co almost completely been eliminated. And in the most recent year, um, the forgotten amount is now down to about $155,000. So SEV and taxable value are now we're at the point where those are pretty much going to be right around the same. I'm going to jump now into the enterprise funds. I'm going to skip this and just cover each separately. Starting with the water fund, a um, couple things here. So you see the operating revenue, um, operating expenses, and then the red line there shows the operating income, which is basically the net difference between the two. Um, looking from 2010 to 2011, you can see that your operating revenue jumped up uh, quite a bit, and that was a direct result of the uh, consumption charge rate that you uh, implemented. And, and, and you'll see uh, sort of a little bit of a different trend in the, in the sewer fund, but one thing I did want to mention is that um, you know, these funds are really doing kind of what you want them to do and what you plan for them to do with your rate changes. Uh, so in, in the water fund, water wouldn't have had as, many, as much reserve as sewer. And so that, you know, that rate was increased to kind of get that fund uh, to where you, where you want it to be. So again, you know, what you plan for it to do is exactly what's happening in that fund for you. Um, sewer, on the other hand, um, you felt that you, know, you were sitting in a good place and you did have adequate reserves, and so in that instance, you actually did reduce that consumption charge. And so again, you can see um, that direct impact there on your operating revenue um, and the overall operating income. So again, you know, it gives the appearance that, oh my God, we've got this negative operating income, but you know, that's really what you want it to be doing to get that fund um, to where you're projecting it out in the future. And then now we're getting into looking at um, some pension data. And as of the most recent um, actuarial valuation, you are showing here, you can see we kind of break it up into the different types or components of your actuarial accrued liability. But overall, that amount um, is about 9.5 million. Again, as of your most recent valuation, uh, you have actuarial value of assets of close to 14 million to offset those liabilities. And so you're showing um, an unfunded actuarial accrued liability of about 5.5 million as of this valuation. However, in 2011, um, you did 
authorize, as I said before, remember those numbers went up, you authorize some additional contributions there. And so those will be reflected in the next valuation and you'll see that gap start to close a little bit. And this is just some statistical data on the um, revenue and receipts, including transfers, coming into each of uh, the city's funds, including the component units. Okay. Alicia, you know, do, do you have the, we had a schedule of the revenue sharing actual versus projected. Is that on your PowerPoint? Yeah, what happened, I believe, we have a previous version right before that was added, so I can make a couple comments. Okay. I think it was the same thing that happened with the percentages for the fund balance. So there is in the printed copies, and I believe in the same uh, on the graphs that were. There's one slide. I skipped. Slide number 14. That's on the hard copies. And that's also available. I believe it's going to be posted on the website as well. So yeah, we can put all this on our website. There. Do you want to go back? To uh, it's not in that. I don't think it's in. We there. don't have that in this one. So you didn't skip the slide. It's just an older version. Okay. Unfortunately, we have copies back? for that. Uh, this the slide 14 is this one. It does show the gap between what the state shared revenues have been versus what the projections would have been if things didn't keep sliding down. And you can see that there's a very drastic gap basically between what we were actually receiving versus uh, what the projections would have been. I believe uh, for 2012, the actual uh, shows 660,000 versus the projected would have been 1.2 million. So about half of what you would have anticipated. And it, I just want to mention, because actually I did have a note here in my copy that if you look from where you were in 1999 to where you are now, over that year, your state share revenue has, has declined by about 35%. So quite a significant decline there. Yeah, coupled with clearly the property taxes, I think, uh, you know, the slide previously on the fund balance that Alicia was going over, I think paints a very good picture of how much, how forward thinking the city council has been over the years. Because I think that, you know, if you hadn't been projecting out what the fund balance is going to be at five years from now, uh, you know, constantly. That picture of, you know, having 24% fund balance compared to your expenditures annually, we might be at 10% or less. I've seen many communities, unfortunately, now actually being at a negative. So, you know, clearly it shows how much, you know, how forward thinking you have been. Because at 24%, I think you're sliding to that level of, okay, let's not get anywhere below. And a lot of cities try and get between 10 and 20 percent, I've always kind of cautioned a lot of cities to be closer to the 20 percent mark, which you're approaching. So I think you've done a very good job of making sure that you don't kind of let things slide. Uh, the other thing I did want to mention on the slides, uh, just real quick too, is water and sewer funds. So I know that especially sewer fund had a pretty significant loss this year. If you compare that to the depreciation expense, they basically, basically offset each other, which basically means that you're still kind of break even on the, from the cash basis perspective, which is, I think you're doing a very good job with that. Questions on anything else that I touched on? Financial statements? Thank you. And so I'm not going to touch on the letter as well. Um, and then feel free to uh, chime in if you have any questions or anything, whether it's about the grass financial statements or anything as well. So the letter is pretty lengthy. Um, it actually comprises, is comprised of three different sections. Uh, the first section is what's called uh, communication required under says 114. It's basically a response to kind of the pre-audit letter that you would have received about, you know, the procedures, you know, what we entail during the audit process, if there's any issues or anything like that. So, and that starts on page three of uh, this letter. Um, basically to summarize it, um, it basically mentions that we didn't have any disagreements with management. The audit process went smoothly. Um, it mentions a couple items to uh, any corrected and uncorrected misstatements that would have been. Uh, there have been some uncorrected adjustments that were not posted, and it's basically a repeat of from every year. Uh, some items are recorded, uh, for example, interest income is recorded when the investment matures, when CDs mature, versus kind of accruing it as the years, year goes by. Uh, technically, it should be accrued. However, the dollar amounts are very small, so it doesn't skew the financial statements. And that's why uh, on an annual basis you do the same thing, and I think that's very comparative from that perspective. On page six are some observations and recommendations. So as a result of the audit, we just have some observations, uh, just things that you could do to tweak uh, the accounting procedures or just kind of to focus on. Uh, cash management, uh, we've noticed that, so first of all, the city uses a pooled cash ac account um, in order to record its cash balances in various funds. 
Um, technically, if some cash balances in certain funds fall to be a negative balance, technically it should be a due to due from between the funds. However, the city still records just negative cash and it's in the cash at line item. It doesn't really impact anything. However, technically it should be recorded as a due to due from. Um, it's done for purposes of investments, so some investments are longer term in order to generate some higher investment income. I know the investment income is unfortunately very low currently, just the interest rates are pretty low. So, um, you know, the finance department is trying to kind of extend out the investments and make sure that, you know, you get the biggest returns you can possibly get. The payroll agency fund, over the years, um, the city utilizes a pay payroll agency fund, and over the years, uh, I think it's, in some respects, it's cumbersome to maintain the agency fund and make sure that you know it splits the cost between all the funds accordingly. Uh, some cities and some municipalities utilize uh, different systems. If you are looking to streamline the processes a little bit, that could be one way of uh, one thing to look at to see if maybe there could be some uh, burden that's alleviated in the record keeping on that side. There's an outstanding receivable from the state of Michigan uh, that we mentioned also last year. It's been outstanding for a couple of years now. Uh, we just kind of encourage the city to keep an eye on that, making sure that, you know, I guess you get your money uh, as quickly as possible. And then last item, information technology. Uh, last year, a couple of years ago, we uh, issued a memo. Uh, there was a new pronouncement that came out that um, basically required the audit firms to uh, review the information technology at every municipality and make, make sure it kind of give you suggestions on what improvements could be uh, provided. Uh, the memo has been attached. Some of those items still pertain. Some of the items, however, have been actually corrected and not really corrected, but implemented uh, kind of, you know, to improve the IT overall. And we did attach the memo. That's one of the reasons why I, I think the letter is a little bit lengthier. And you'll see that attachment B. The last item is section three, which starts on page seven. And uh, section three is legislative and informational items that pertain kind of currently to uh, state happenings. And I know some of the items have been already uh, discussed when the representative was discussing uh, some of the um, new bills and so on. Uh, first items um, that we talk about is budgetary stress, and Alicia mentioned that multiple times during the graph presentation, just with all the pressures and declines in property taxes, state share, shared revenues, building permits, interest income. I think the city's done a great job, but however, we encourage you to keep an eye on that because clearly the levels have, we don't know where the levels are, you know, where it's going to stop and start increasing again. So we just encourage the city to keep looking at it. The personal property taxes, I know that's a hot topic currently. Uh, we're all anxiously awaiting to see what happens. Um, and it just mentions, you know, what the revenues are, um, you know, what percentage. It's actually 20% of overall property taxes for the city. So we're talking about significant revenue source. There's some bills that have been passed, health care initiatives, um, Senate Bill 7. Uh, discusses in a little bit more details for you, and I, I think you're all aware of um, you know, all the details. However, we do provide those just in case you have any questions. On page eight at the bottom, the retro pay prohibition, if the contracts are being negotiated but nothing's been settled yet, there is no retro pay, and actually the employees incur the cost for any increased premiums for health care. Uh, page nine talks about the state initiatives uh, in the EVIP, the Economic Vitality Incentive Program. Basically, that relates to your statutory revenue sharing. Uh, the city has uh, actually submitted, there was a due date of October 1st to su uh, supply certain documents and put them on your website. So the city has done that and has uh, done that by October 1st. Um, and that relates to basically, your, like I said, your st statutory revenue sharing, which is $75,000 for last year. So we're probably talking about a slightly smaller dollar amount ne next year because the statutory portion has been decreasing over the years. However, it's still a um, significant amount of money overall, significant portion of your state shared revenues. There's also some other items that are going to be required in order to be submitted, um, including the service sharing consolidation kind of agreement and plan, and it's going to be due by January 1st of 2012, and that's outlined on page 10 at the top. Uh, there's also a couple other items that are mentioned um, on the bottom of page 10, other legislative developments, including uh, proposed changes to Act 312, police and fire arbitration, as well as some other um, uh, changes and proposed bills that are in the works right now in the state. This is the most recent information that we could provide, but again, kind of everything keeps changing, it seems like, from day to day. So uh, this letter is dated October 4th, so a couple of things. Um, I believe that everything's up to date, but again, uh, I would kind of keep changing, you know, keep 
getting updates from the state and what we're going to do too is we're going to send any updates uh, to the city as well if we hear of any, any new development. And that's all we have on the presentation. Um, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to uh, you know, address those currently or we can uh, also come back or you, know, you can uh, funnel those through, you know, through the mayor or through the city manager. Uh, we'd be happy to address those at any time. So any council members have any questions? I know there's a lot of material. Mr. Rhodes. Yeah, thank you. You, you knew I was going to put my hand up, right? <laughs> um, there were three um, issues that arose as I worked my way through the audit document. Um, and the first one is probably not addressed to you so much as it is perhaps to, our, to ourselves. And that is on page 29, it talks about the Economic Development Trust which had no activity this last year. And looking at last year's audit, I noticed it had no activity either. And um, I, I was wondering, I'm assuming the Economic Development Trust is there to provide funds to satisfy loan requests from new, to encourage new business startups? Uh, Mr. Burgoyne talked to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Economic Development uh, Trust Fund um, was set up to uh, promote economic development in a couple of ways in the community with recycled block grant funds, block grant funds that had been used once and were being used again. Um, those have completely run out. Um, the, the agency is not entirely disbanded, but it's totally inactive. So. It's just sitting there as a structure. There's, it's not doing anything at this time. Um, potentially, some, you know, some funds could come back that could be used by that agency. But right now, we don't see any. Could we uh, sort of in line with my uh, query about last council meeting about the possibility of doing something with some EDC funds that might generate some longer-term revenues? Could we? Um, consider the allocation of some EDC funds to serve the purpose that this trust did? Um, if you used EDC funds, you'd have to use them within the corporation. And EDTF is not set up to get and use EDC funds. You could do some activity within the Economic Development Corporation itself, but not send the funds off somewhere else. I mean, you, you could set something up to not completely use your EDC funds, to hold on to them, to do something with them within the Economic Development Corporation itself. Okay, so it wouldn't be within this group, but it could be used somewhere because, you know, we are, we are trying to encourage businesses to start up in our downtown and if um, with, a, with the current difficulty of obtaining regular bank funding, if there's a way that the city could provide loans to those people after the appropriate reviews, um, then we could have some interest earnings coming back and maybe set up a revolving fund that we could continue to help businesses. Um, the, other, um, the other item, uh, on page 37, there's a statement that I don't understand because I don't have an accounting background, but interest rate risk. It's the risk that the value of investments will decrease as a result of a rise in interest rates. You know, I, from my perspective, if the interest rates go up and I've got investments out there and earn an interest, that's a good thing. But obviously, this is talking about something else. It depends on the type of investment. So uh, as an example, for example, bonds, if uh, the interest rate goes, on bond, goes up on bonds, it changes the value of the actual principal as well, how much you can sell that for. So it does depend on the investment. If you're talking about, for example, a CD um, that's purchased from a bank, clearly if the- It's a good thing. If it's a good thing. The problem is also you're locked in at the interest rate you've bought it at. So technically your investment might not be worth as much as something that you've purchased currently if the interest rate did go up. Unfortunately, it's not projected. I, I don't believe that interest rates are not projected to go up in the next couple of years, but- Yeah, it doesn't seem to be that way. And then the- uh, the last question I had, you, you answered partially when I was, I was wondering what that receivable was that you were suggesting that perhaps we consider writing off. And uh, apparently it's something from the state of Michigan. Yeah, I believe there are some forms that were filed and the state asked for some additional forms. Uh, we've 
discussed it in details with the city and it seems like it will be collectible. It's just a matter of time and it's, it's just been outstanding for quite a bit of time. So we just want to make sure that you're aware of it and you keep pursuing the collection. Okay. Do we know offhand what the dollar amount is of that receivable? I believe it's receivable. Right. And it's from a prior year um, Michigan Tax Tribunal Court Appeal, uh, or sorry, Tax Appeal um, from uh, Vistion. And so we had, we had to refund that money and then we let the jurisdiction, we refund it for all the jurisdictions and the jurisdictions pay us back. Um, the state, I believe, Mickey Joe, it's in the $300,000 range. Uh, I believe maybe a little more than that. Um, that is due to the city from the state. And we continue, every year we continue to work on this and we tell us to submit different forms or other forms and we do that. And I know Mickey Joe's office is, uh, has another contact name that we're currently working on to try and again, resolve that and get that uh, uh, paid to us. Perhaps our state representative could inter intercede on our behalf when he's out there. Thank you, sir. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Any other further questions? Any other council members? I just um, appreciate what you said about the fund balance. I would say that's due to the diligence of our staff, and um, we, you know, were uh, threatened with the closure of a major facility in Saline that we tightened our belts for a while and very purposely not. Of course, it came along with a recession also too, but um, that ACH facility was um, previous to that. So, but as we heard today from Bill Ford, things are going gangbusters. So if we can lower that fund balance a little bit, and we're hoping that things continue to move forward in a positive way. Absolutely. Thank you for your audit report. Well, Is thank you for your questions? time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a, um, I just wanted also to <coughs> say that um, the audit report is on the um, website. Um, I know there were some student comments expressing concern that it's confidential. It's not confidential. Um, the, our reports are on the website and they have been on the website for many years. And we also, all, in addition to that, have been doing a budget report for the last how many years? Three or four years? Yeah, um, plus it's in the hallway as a paper copy. It's fully in the hallway and it's fully at the uh, Saline District Library. Yeah, I think on that reserve. one piece is it's a, that was a management report on the operations and I think that's what that paragraph is referring to. So we have a motion to acknowledge receipt and accept the October 4th, 2011 letter and financial report from Plant Moran for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2011. So moved. Second. <clears throat> moved Kirba, second moral. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? Motion carries. Under new business item 11166, community events, the tree lighting ceremony and holiday parade. This would be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the September 30th, 2011 memo, an application for community event, use of public ways from downtown director Trapp regarding the tree lighting ceremony to approve or not approve the tree lighting ceremony to be held on December 2nd, 2011, 7 p.m. at the corner of Michigan Avenue and North Ann Arbor Street with closing of North Ann Arbor Street from Michigan to parking lot number one, subject to the traffic engineer issuing the required temporary traffic control orders for street closing and the required MDOT permit for closing the left turn lane on Michigan Avenue. Move to approve. Move roads. Second. Second, Gearba. To approve. Yes. Discussion. Mr. Just Peters. I have one question. Uh, first of all, I think this is a wonderful event. It's one of my favorite in town. But on the uh, the amount to be waived, three thousand four hundred ninety-four. Just want to make sure we get the minutes correct. When I look at the. Uh, Tell you about the second motion. Yeah. Okay. Do the one before that. It's the um, tree lighting. There's two. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Are you? No, I'm talking about the parade. Okay. Is there any further discussion on the motion to approve the tree lighting ceremony? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, the second motion is to acknowledge receipt of the September 30, 2011 letter and application for community event use of public ways from Larry Osterling, Salinary Chamber of Commerce for the annual holiday parade to acknowledge receipt of the October 3, 2011 memo from Police Chief Button, the October 10, 2011 memo from Fire Chief Heft, and the October 13, 2011 memo from Public Works Director Fordyce 
to approve or not approve the holiday parade to be held on Saturday, December 3rd, 2011, as outlined in the September 30th, 2011 letter, subject to the following conditions. One, that the traffic engineer issue the required traffic control orders for the street closures and use as a parade route as needed for this event. Two, that the required permit from MDOT be obtained for the closing of Mission Avenue. Three, that a certificate insurance be required by the applicant with the City of Saline as an endorsed additional insured party. Four, that the applicant obtain approval from the property owner of the shopping plaza for the events to be held at that location. And five, that the Port of John rental fees and fees for police and DPW service, which are over and above the normal operating costs, estimated at $3,494, be waived. Do we have a motion? I would um, move to approve and uh, with a question on the dollar amount of fees to be waived. Second. So are you moving? <coughs> Why don't we just move the first half then to move receipt? You have questions? Well, only that there's a difference between the dollars that are here and the dollars that are on um, Mr. Fordyce's DPW thing, and maybe they came in at it's different because, times. Because it's above at regular hours. It's just. Um, it's it's the it's the um it's it's only over and above it's over and above normal operating costs. So right. he put all costs. So that wasn't right. Yeah. Uh, so you have the police. It's yeah, confusing. so it should be just the twenty three seventy two and the one twenty two. What and then there's a police one. Right, it's it's the overtime, the Port of John Rental, and the police. Those are the three. Six hundred ninety-five dollars off. So it's oh, it's not the regular cost. It's not yeah, the okay. okay. Got it. Okay, so a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Further discussion. Mr. Peters, you had a question. Well, same question. That was the same question. Is there any further questions? Do you guys want to get up and talk about what you're doing? I know it's early, but get I'll everybody to get talk it on their calendar. Pardon? So get everybody to get it on their calendar. You bet. Um, I'll just talk quickly about the tree lighting, <clears throat> which is um, the Friday <clears throat> before the parade on December 2nd. Um, I went out and asked the community for uh, donation of a tree which uh, for the last couple of years we've had people just step up and donate a tree. Um, I was a little concerned about it and then after we put something out on uh, B. Celine and uh, our Facebook site, uh, we went and looked at four different locations for people who are willing to donate a tree. Uh, we're getting the tree from the Maple Village over here across from the post office for this year and then for next year we already have a tree from um, Esther Leo uh, out on uh, Fosdick Road who has about 350 trees on her property and is happy to get rid of one or two at a time so we're going to do that and then as far as the parade goes uh, it's coming along uh, fundraising is working and uh, we're, we're not at our budget yet but we're getting getting there so I don't know what else to say about that but well, I can be my guest thank you um, as mentioned, we're early getting this in this year. I feel really good about that because um, things tend to have happen at the um, chamber the fourth quarter get really uh, intense. But um, <clears throat> of all the things, all the events that the chamber does all year long, this is a, um, a real mix of total community involvement. This is, I think, our 38th, 39th, I'm not sure, I lost count, um, parade, but it's really an opportunity from my, from our side, but to see how much comes together in terms of total community cooperation, including the city, but uh, thousands of volunteers and 
Um, the chamber has right now about $3,100 in commitments um, towards the parade so far and different contractees I have. Um, those are people we try to get at early because our, it isn't just a parade. It's, I mean, it's a showcase for the community and there's things that go on all week long, the week before and the week after. It's um, obviously it generates commerce, it generates travel in our area, but um, it also says a lot about us and the fact that our, our quote, parade itself has become one of the more, um, I think, and I think Art will agree, one of the more spectacular ones in all of Southeast Michigan. So um, we're all to be congratulated. I totally understand um, that there's a cost involved in the city's fees. They have waived them all 12 years I've been here, but I think going forward, it's an ongoing discussion that's gonna happen with every event you do, and uh, we'll work with you on however, whatever direction that moves. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to add a sidelight comment um, because I had, as sort of a, a outgrowth of this parade that's come up, we also got involved in seasonal tree lighting, which has sort of taken a life of its own. And that fund this year will be exhausted. Um, I don't know if you've noticed around, particularly on Sundays, my tree lighting guy, who I intend to have come and talk, hopefully in front of you sometime in December after the parade, um, anyway, that, it, it's going to involve some fundraising effort on our part to replenish and keep that tree lighting presentation going forward. A lot of cities can't afford to do what he does, but you can see what the presentation is. That's a uh, nice looking, um, you can tell a home job, a city that's done a home job and a city does a professional job. We have a professional presentation and I think it's interesting to hear this individual when you, you hear him, he's, he's involved in other cities like Farmington Hills and Charlevoix and everyone has a, He's from Manchester. Manchester has a great presentation. This year, Brooklyn's on board. Last year, Chelsea. Everybody's following these. Everybody comes to Celine to see what we've got and want to replicate it. Um, but that's coming up, and that's going to be a major, major fundraising expense for us. I anticipate being able to fund that mostly from the private sector. Um, whatever's left, Lee, huh, budget-wise, we may do a challenge. I think we may put up some chamber money if the city wants to help us challenge money for the rest of the community to help pay for that. It's going to be a major expense. That's coming after the parade, but until um, then, I'm hoping to get some sponsor money in and have another great presentation. I think it's um, y'all. I think we all should be as a community proud of the way this comes off every December. I could go on forever, but uh, you didn't give me my three-minute warning. Then <laughs> I just want to mention one more thing. Um, look back in statist some statistics um, back to the year 2000. And the number of people who have participated in the Celine Parade from 2000 to last year is over 18,000 people. So that'll give you some idea of um, the number of folks who have participated in the parade over the last 11 years, which I think is just awesome. We'd like to have a better count of the number of people watching, but that's a total estimate on somebody's part. Can I count it from the back of the dump? Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Any uh, questions? We probably should mention just one really quick last thing. This Thursday is our Business Enterprise Awards. If you haven't signed up to come to that yet, that to me is the most important award our chamber makes every year. Um, we do a lot of awards, but this one is the top businesses, the ones that have made it in the community, the ones that, like Celine, in the current economic environment have proven they can make it. And this year's the um, honorees, I can't call them winners, the honorees are um, Unimerco, Kiyosero, Unimerco, and Cobblestone Rose. And there's also, we're also making a special lifetime presentation to Jim and Marsha Duncan from Calico Cat, so it'll be kind of a special thing. Yeah. Time? Um, Six. I'm lost without looking on my website. <laughs> no, it's five, it starts at 5.30 at Stonebridge Golf Club. And um, there's also a dinner involved. And there you can get more information off of our website, make reservations, that kind of thing. But if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do, need to do it fast. So hopefully this will get on cable TV and lots of people will see it. Thank you. Thank you. You guys, does anybody have any questions about the parade? <coughs> That's good. <laughs> Never mind. You're all set. Thank you. Thanks for your work on that. So we have a motion to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. On item 11161, this is a motion to now receive the October 11th, 2011 memo from Administrative Assistant Myra regarding attendance at National League of Cities Con Congress of Seas Conference in Phoenix, Arizona from November 9th to 12th, 2011, to authorize Mayor Driscoll to attend the NLC 2011 Congress of Cities Conference at an estimated cost of $1,354.
Um, since this was brought off by a citizen, I thought I might want to talk a little bit about what happens at an NLC conference before you vote on this. Although some of you have attended and know, um, that's, this is opportunity. I appreciate the concern about um, valid spending of city dollars, tax dollars. Um, we do bring back a lot of um, opportunities regarding grant opportunities. We, I have brought back um, multiple different um, programs. For, for example, a prescription program that's benefited multiple citizens to the tune of thousands of dollars. The web video on the city website, which was valued at $40,000. Most recent is a line insurance program that NLC just adopted, which gives citizens an opportunity to protect, um, to have insurance to protect the cost of replacing their line. The other thing, um, I've been on a board, National League of Cities board, and I'm now on the advisory council and serve as a um, liaison to the community and regional development, which um, is an, uh, they study regional planning um, opportunities for ways to uh, do regional economic development. Um, and then the other thing, there's other, you know, our state is in, how do we say, a little bit of a flux regarding revenue, and I really appreciate the representative coming today to talk about, you know, saying that he's going, he's going to be supportive of guaranteed a revenue replacement because it's a huge problem in our state. We haven't identified a revenue replacement source. And um, other states are doing things differently than we do things. And that's one of the things that I learn about or whoever goes to these conferences learns about. The other thing, we also learn about best practices from other communities. So it's a very um, full plate of lots of conferences, uh, lots of work sessions regarding all sorts of different subjects. And um, we usually come back with some different strong programs. The one thing that um, Lee was talking about re relative to Community Development Block Grant, that is a program that we have not been able to access lately and the f um, federal government keeps um, talking about cutting that um, back further, which we would like it to go the other way because those are opportunities for doing economic development locally. Um, and I was going to say, oh, the other thing, a lot of other communities have lobbyists, which we do not, and what the National League of Cities does is represents um, the communities at the federal level and helps us um, be at the table for federal legislation. Um, to that end, I was recently invited to go to meet with the senior um, administrators in DC and also to the White House. And um, I am not, the city will be paying for my train fare and my airfare. No, actually the airfare of the league is gonna pay for, but I'm flying into BWI to save money and I'm staying at my uh, cousin's house. So, but I hope to have an opportunity to um, talk to some of our senior administrators about Celine and what they could do in our community. So um, it's a great opportunity to learn about new programs that the city community might have an opportunity to access. So that's why I go. So there is a motion um, that uh, is on the consent agenda to acknowledge receipt, which I read. If there would be a motion to authorize, that would be great. I move to authorize. And do we have a second? Second. Discussion? Mr. Gearbox. Mayor, I know you've worked hard on this for the last 10, 12 years, and your representation has helped the city a great deal. And I know your efforts and everything that you've done at those um, NLC conferences and things are quite re reflected in what you've brought back to us. I've seen you work hard on it. I've seen you represent us as a great candidate, and I think this is a worthwhile training, not only for us, but also representation that we need to continue as our city. Uh, it's not a bailiwig or anything else. It's a type of trip that, as since you're representing us on their um, different committees and different areas, I think that shows how much work and dedication you put in the NLC and how it's representing your dedication to our city. So further discussion, Mr. Rhodes. I'd just like to say that I moved the motion because it's a, it's a great way for networking and um, it seems like every time our mayor goes to this conference, she comes back with some new ideas about how we can further improve the quality of life uh, within our community. And uh, in my opinion, it's well worth this, uh, this investment. Is there further discussion? Was Mr. Peters? Uh, <clears throat> The city is a business, this is a, this is a common business practice, and if it didn't have value, then businesses wouldn't do it. So it, it helps us keep current and keep up the pace with other communities to see it, how they do things. And you never know what somebody else is liable to say, you come back with some good ideas, can save you a whole lot more money than what you invested. Mr. Hart. 
Yes, I, I thank you. I would also say, in my um, experience on council in the last year, I haven't, uh, I have no experience with the National League of Cities, but my experience with the Michigan Municipal League has been extremely valuable for my own education as a council member, and um, I also value the lobbying um, that the organization does, and I'm assuming the National League of Cities plays a similar similar role at national level. Um, also, as a librarian, as a professional librarian, um, I gained a lot of um, knowledge and ideas and um, professional development from attending professional conferences. And um, I, I think this is an incredibly um, cheap, actually, cost for the kind of return that you get from attending such a conference. Is there further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Under discussion, do we have any commissioner committee reports? Uh, Mr. Hart? Um, yes, the, the Arts and Culture Committee um, continues to work on uh, sculpture walk planning um, where the um, Making arrangements for sculpture display on private property is proving to be um, a little more time consuming um, than we anticipated. Uh, the committee has also, uh, on this a week ago today, um, for its meeting, visited the Tecumseh Sculpture Walk to review how they have laid theirs out, and um, it was very enjoyable. Their focus is a little bit different, but um, I think we learned uh, some valuable lessons for how we might approach ours. Thank you. Mr. Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I attended the last um, Saline Area Fire Board meeting along with my colleague, uh, Mr. Gearbaugh, I think two Wednesdays ago, and uh, that group also received um, their annual audit from Plant Moran. In fact, the same gentleman that presented tonight um, presented uh, two weeks ago. Um, and the, the audit uh, went very well. Um, there were no red flags. There was nothing that was identified that was particularly pr uh, problematic. Um, and the, the report was accepted unanimously by the board. Other than that, it was a relatively uneventful meeting. And of course, Mr. Gearboff would like to add anything. You covered it. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other commissioner committee reports? Uh, reports and other announcements? Mr. Rhodes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, two things. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> the, um, on November the 5th, there will be two events in the city of Saline. The first that I would like to mention is the electronic waste recycle event, co-sponsored by the Environmental Commission. It will be held down at the Team Center, uh, corner of Willis and South Ann Arbor Street, from 9 until 4. The second event on November the 5th will be the first indoor winter market of the season which will take place at Liberty School in the uh, wide hallway on the east side of the building. Uh, we tried a, a much smaller winter market last year and it was proven to be viable and um, so we're, we've gone to a larger one. And <clears throat> I, um, the, sus the suspicion is that we will draw people from um, the Ann Arbor area to come down also to winter market because there isn't another indoor one in the area and it's open to the public. So. And um, Nancy Crisp is the market manager, and she's doing an excellent job of pulling things together. She had a meeting of all the potential vendors for the winter market um, last week and uh, had a lot of new faces there. So I, I think uh, there's a possibility we may fill all the available spaces. And the other thing is um, I had uh, hoped to have my notes from the Michigan Municipal League Convention uh, available to uh, give a, a summary of this evening and to pass out, but I'm only about halfway through deciphering my uh, attempts at, at making notes and, and getting them put into a Word document that people could read. So um, I'll continue to work on that, and um, when I can get it completed, I'll make copies for uh, council, and I will post it on my blog, which is um, David Rhodes Celine. Um, it, it was a very worthwhile convention, those three days, um, actually two and a half very full days, and um, 
I, like probably some of the other folks who were able to attend, um, sacrificed income to do that. Took basically three days, three unpaid days off from work to attend the, uh, the convention and to bring back ideas to uh, help our community be an even better community than it is. So uh, I was pleased to be given that opportunity and I will follow through with, uh, with my notes at some point. Thank you. Maybe we should all um, work because we went to different sessions. Some of us had some overlap, but um, as I was just, I just made notes from my memory. You know, one of the things that we had the governor uh, spoke and talked a lot about, you know, as you heard, personal property tax revenue is 20% of our revenue. So that's a very alarming scenario. And as you also heard from our audit report, we have lost substantial, you know, when they say replacement, sometimes gets replaced, but then the replacement disappears over time. So we're very alarmed because it seems that there's definitely momentum to get rid of it, which is fine if it's going to help our businesses, but we can't really afford to absorb an additional 20% when we've been taking all these significant cuts over time. So it, um, that's one of the things that I think several of us were at. There was a session on the state and federal initiatives and how they're impacting our local operations. And um, we went from the governor being very, you know, we want to be your partner. I actually tweeted, you know, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be partners, no blame, no change, or, and then positive, um, what was it, po positive rapid response. I don't know, I, have, I tweeted it, but um, it's then t to this scenario that our lobbyists laid out, which was, you know, that actually this whole personal property tax legislation sound, you know, was actually really closer to being rolled out in the legislature than what I felt like we were hearing. And I don't think that was a um, misrepresentation by the governor. I think it was just what he, how he was talking and then, you know, how he was talking in a very broad spectrum, like it's going to be a five to ten years, sort of what um, Representative meant. But, you know, it was a good, we had some really good conversations with the governor and um, the lobbyists and then I actually um, had talked to Todd about, I moderated a session that was really um, interesting around foreclosures and um, Celine's been pretty fortunate not to have the number of foreclosures other communities have. There is definitely um, disconnect between a home and when it gets taken over by a bank to find out how, you know, the way that a home is deteriorating, how, who's responsible for that. There are some mechanisms out there that um, the league brought in this, what they call service providers to the banks that is actually, I think, going to be a really helpful vehicle not only for our community, but all the communities in the county that are planning to bring back to the county. So I know that there's other things that, because I know um, Mr. Har and Council Member, Cam uh, excuse me, City Manager <laughs> Campbell, we all went and I think, you know, we were, went to different sessions, so there's a lot of compilation um, and information to put together. But um, anyhow. So just because I also had that on my list too to talk about. So I don't know if um, you want to talk about it or um, Mr. Campbell this oh. time. Relentless positive, thank you. Anyways. Yeah, I would just say also it was extremely valuable. Um, and because we have Brecken guests right now, I haven't had a chance to uh, write up my notes either, but I fully intend to share. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just share briefly, um, uh, Council Member Mr. Harnett Rhodes also happened to attend this session with me, but it's uh, on the Trilogy of Management, and um, I went uh, to the training this past winter through the MML, um, through the Ciroli Institute, and we, where we talked about, um, we talked about uh, at the Joint uh, Chamber Board and City uh, Council meeting, um, uh, reference um, when you have you know, an entrepreneur, um, no entrepreneur does it all themselves by themselves. They, you know, you have the person with the passion that, that, that makes the widget, whether that's a, you know, uh, a service, whether that's a product, whatever that is. Um, and sometimes they can even be good marketers where they can actually sell that, right? But um, oftentimes, um, well, I think none of the times do they, do they have that financial management component. So you sometimes, unfortunately, you see some of these very bright folks when they, they have they have a passion for um, this product, and like I said, they may or may not be able to sell it. But if they can sell it, but then they don't know how to manage uh, the finances. And so this trilogy of management helps to um, 
work with these folks um, if they want, and it's based on th them coming in and asking for help as opposed to, you know, as you hear, is, is you, you hear the saying, you know, hi, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. So, um, um, but uh, um, this is, this is uh, based on them coming to, say, for instance, to, to me asking, you know, you know, maybe some guidance, some help, and, and, um, and one of the things that I want to do is, is, is follow up and, and, and work with, uh, with Larry in the chamber um, with this. But anyway, again, it was a, it was a follow up <coughs> presentation. And I, I know uh, Mr. Rose and Mr. Har and I had a, some brief conversations around it and certainly some, uh, some room to, to move that initiative forward a little bit. Uh, so, but that was, again, that was very good um, as well that particular session. And there was a number of good sessions, but that was one that stuck out for me. Okay, is there any other reports or announcements? Well, Mr. Tohar, you alluded to the fact that yes. we have a, a, quite a crowd of Welsh people here. We had the chambers full last Wednesday. I don't know if you want to talk about our guests. Um, we have. That's why we have flags with dragons yes. on them in our downtown, in case people yes. are wondering what the dragons were flying around. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, we have 18 visitors from Wales who are today at the midpoint of their two-week visit. Um, they've had several excursions, um, local excursions, and right now they're uh, on a trip up north visiting the Traverse City area tomorrow. Pray for good weather. They will be, uh, they're <coughs> scheduled to visit Sleeping Bear Dunes. Um, they'll be returning on Wednesday, and then there's uh, some additional activities, um, and they'll be leaving next Tuesday. Um, I should probably add, in case anyone's wondering, the funding for all of the hosting activities is raised by the Celine Brecken Friendship Guild um, by fundraising efforts. It's, there's no tax money involved. And there's lots of citizens that are involved, though. That yes, involved. yeah, the, the, um, the guests are staying in Celine homes. Um, in, in many cases, since this is a, a partnership, sister city relationship that's existed for 45 years, um, many of the people who are here have already visits, so visited Celine multiple times um, and are staying in the homes of the people they've, they've been friends with for many years. So um, new friendships are being formed, but it's also a great time for great reunions. Okay, is there any other reports or, or announcements? Okay, under public comment under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time, may comment or question the City Council. This public comment period will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. John Heller, <clears throat> John Heller 213 Sheffield. I may be misreading the community and maybe the national mood as a whole, but it just, the reason I made my comment about the mayor's trip to Phoenix is that it seems to me from what I can gather is that people don't, the general people, public, does not see the value in, the, in spending tax dollars for that kind of travel. And I'm not doubting what you're saying that you receive value from it, but I don't know if it's quantifiable and I don't know if people in general understand it. I mean, there may need to be some debate. And you know, really, now that I've made these statements, the people can render their verdict on November 8th. You know, I may get elected, I may not after making the statements that I made, and people may feel that what you're saying is, is valid and that um, the money is well spent. But I, but I also feel like there's a lot of comment out there in the community that that kind of spending is not what people want and that that's why they question, as I said, why they question whether you need the, fund, the, the funds from personal property taxes, any other kind of taxes. I think there's a sentiment out there that says that government's not spending their money wisely. You say that's a good good way to spend money. It may be and they may approve of it, but I guess we'll find out. Um, the other thing, I guess my Orwellian comment may have been appropriate on the paragraph in the accounting letter. It says it's only for city council use and council management and yet they're saying it's a public document. That seems like a contradiction to me. Um, double speak, I don't know. I don't know why the paragraph is there if in fact it is a public document. It seems like a contradiction. Thank you. Mary Laronis, 373 West Bennett. 
Um, I was interested in the remarks from representative we met, and of course I have an opinion on everything he said, but I'll try to confine myself. Um, coming out of Lansing is exactly what one would expect from a group of business people, entrepreneurs, and venture capitalists, as well as professional politicians. They use words like best management practices, consolidation, fiscal responsibility. Translated, that means gradual movement from local grassroots control of government policy to large governmental units with control passing to elected officials far removed from the citizens they are governing. In particular, consolidation of 911 dispatch should be left up to local citizens. They know what they want and need far better than, in our case, a legislator from Sio Township and a senator from Monroe. The holding hostage of our tax dollars by the state until we meet their idea of best management should be vigorously opposed by local citizenry. Thank you. Mary Hess. There's been comments on proper usage of taxpayers' money, and we have entered a new financial picture. When the mayor speaks of the uh, dramatic decrease of possibly our revenue, I think trips do come into the picture. I think the Christmas lights downtown that is gonna be a costly replacement come into the picture. And there are many things that I would hope the council will address, even though it is a, has the appearance of servicing the public. The public is having a rough time in their economics, tremendously rough, which is a roof over their head. And I think that must be taken into account when we're addressing the other things. Thank you. have uh, a brief comment on behalf of the chamber and by the way mrs. Hess I think I did mention the seasonal lighting was some an effort that will be funded out of the private sector if at all possible um, I think it we should all take notice of the fact um, within the CPA community at plant Moran has a stellar name in the fact that the city once again is getting a grades reflects well in the management and the thinking of um, the administration and um, that's something that's given notice every year at the chamber um, we have a lot of government around here, and I think um, it always gets more challenging. But you've made it again, and I think um, you can take a certain amount of solace and pride in getting the A grade again this year. Thank you. Is there any other business come before the City Council? If not, we have on our agenda. Our next meeting is November 7th at 7.30 is a regular meeting, but at 6.30 we're going to have a work session to follow up on the work session from tonight. November 21st we will also be having a meeting at 7.30, but we will be having a work session at 6 o'clock to review the update of our health care analysis and uh, next steps. S and then our 5th and 19th at right now are regularly scheduled for 7.30. Do we have a motion to adjourn at 9.08? Moved. Move Morrow. Second. Second, Gearbaugh. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.